I would now like to introduce today's presenters. Ricky Sondrani is a partner in the pricing assurance practice leading the firm's cloud infrastructure and cybersecurity services price and solutions benchmarking capability. Rahul Barwi. Rahul Barwi is the vice president of the pricing assurance team and assists clients on topics related to price benchmarking, solution review, and contract evaluation for business process services, BPS, consulting services, and service optimization, optimization technologies. Amanpreet Manchanja is a practice director on the pricing assurance team. He advises clients on inquiries and initiatives related to the price benchmarking, contract assessment, and solution design associated with IT application and digital services. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to Ricky. Hi, thank you everyone for joining in today. So uh, just setting the agenda for the next 55, 60 minutes that we got, we're gonna cover. I think if you look back over the last two to three years, the outsourcing industry has seen it all, right? A pandemic followed by a, a significant talent crisis that we saw last year. And now we are in a situation where there's a lot of caution, scrutiny in terms of spending on outsourcing or generally IT services. So in fact, that's, that's a question that we're going to try and address over today's call, right? I mean, is it for real or is the IT market still quite resilient? So we're going to try and first talk about what's the macroeconomic environment and the state of the market in Europe? Uh, and then subsequently, how is that leading into what are the contemporary enterprise expectations from outsourcing in Europe, right? What are European organizations looking for from their outsourcing partners? Is it pricing? Is it commercial? Is it solution flexibility? Is it ESG, right? ESG is sort of a very important topic for a lot of enterprises, especially in Europe. So we're going to cover some of that. And then based off the macroeconomic situation and the subsequent enterprise expectations that in enterprises have expectations for outsourcing in Europe. We're going to die and try and cover in terms of what, sh what should be a, a good outsourcing deal look like? What's the blueprint of a good outsourcing deal look like in today's times in Europe? And then subsequently, we'll also open the floor for uh, any Q&A from the audience. So let's get started with that. Um, if we if we first talk about the the state of the market really so um, if we try and look at things from a demand side of things so it would be stating the obvious but the the macroeconomic uncertainty is still pretty much obvious uh, with the multiple indicators which are pointing to that right so if you look at the 10 minus 2 treasury yield spread which is that it is the highest which has, has ever been over the last 40 years and uh, recession probability models multiple of them are showing an upswing uh, Closer to the ground level, we are seeing that consumer prices have soared and uh, will continue to soar in many geographies as predicted for this year as well. But loan volumes have actually declined materially due to the high cost of capital. Uh, of course, then given the events that have conspired in the last three weeks in the US with the SVB crisis and closer back home in Switzerland over what, what happened uh, over the weekend with the Credit Suisse debate, I think one thing we can all agree on is that the chances of depression and demand and low sentiment seem uh, quite real at this stage. Now, if we move on, if we try and look at things from a, from a sell side perspective right so uh, how are service providers faring in this situation um, if you look at things from a talent crisis that we witnessed in 2022 it has now given way to a bit more stability in the talent market uh, as you can see from these charts attrition numbers have sort of come down across all major providers in the industry and uh, they are expected to come down for the jan march quarter as well so even though we did not we, we would not say that the talent crisis has completely gone away. What we would say is generally it's in a better shape than what it was through the through the second half of 2021 and the first half of 2022. And now and the reason why I'm stressing all, all this is it's important to understand some of these trends because they play a key role in terms of setting, setting expectations from enterprise organizations from outsourcing, right? Uh, just to understand how the expectations have evol evolved over the last few quarters, uh, of, of course, which my colleague Rahul will cover shortly in the subsequent slides. Now, if we move on and, and try to sort of combine these two views, right? If you try and look at it from an overall supply demand perspective, uh, and this is probably one of the most important factors that will shape 
uh, the, the the IT BPS services market uh, over 2023. So while at an overall level, we see that the talent demand supply gap is reducing. And while the trend is expected to continue uh, lower hiring requirements in given the lower iteration, the demand, however, the, we are anticipating that the demand will still remain higher than the supply in the next one to two years. So in simple words, uh, there'll be more jobs than people available to fill them, especially in engineering, IT, and some other areas. So skills such as DevOps, automation, cloud, cybersecurity will continue to demand a high, uh, sort of continue to see high supply demand mismatch. Although we expect skills such as traditional application development, infrastructure services, they will normalize, probably normalize over time. And now moving on, uh, in, in the next section, we're gonna talk about what are some of those Given all this, what we've looked at in the market, we're going to talk about what are some of the contemporary enterprise expectations from an outsourcing perspective in Europe. And Rahul is, is going to do a deep dive in terms of those. Thanks, Ricky. Uh, yes, the current econo uh, microeconomic sentiment and higher probability of recession in 2023, obviously, the enterprise expectation also seem to be changing. This is evident from the key issues survey that we conducted across more than 200 enterprises to understand their issues, priorities, and directions. If you look at the key business challenges enterprise expect in 2023, the price or cost pressure has risen to number one, followed by adapting to evolving customer needs and business model, and the talent shortage, uh, which has moved to number three from number one in 2022. The service provider price increases that we saw in last 12 months and the enterprise side spend reduction mandates has clearly pushed the price or cost pressure challenge to the top. Uh, even the talent or skill shortage has moved to number three rank from number one in the previous year. This indicates that the talent shortage has certainly eased up a bit uh, as was explained by Ricky earlier, but the talent demand supply mismatch still remains. Interestingly, slowness in demand has moved up the ranks to number four, which was not observed in the top seven in last two years. And slowness in customer decision making is also mentioned as a key business challenge by enterprises, considering the current economic uncertainty. Now we will move on from business challenges to the key business priorities for enterprises. The top three priorities for enterprises and service provider for 2023 are cost optimization, uh, digital transformation, and productivity improvement. It is not a surprise considering the top business challenges highlighted by enterprises earlier is price pressure or cost pressure. Basically, enterprises are looking at ways to reduce their overall spend through cost optimization measures, including price negotiations, more offshoring, or even rebalancing or consolidating their service provider portfolio. Considering the recent service provider bill rate increases observed in the last 12 months, productivity improvement will be an important lever, lever moving forward in 2023. More and more enterprises are engaging with their providers for initiatives like automation, process standardization, and Lean Six Sigma initiatives for productivity improvements. We are also hearing increased focus on digital transformation, customer experience improvement, and innovation. Before we, we move on to the next section uh, on enterprise selection criteria, why don't we do a quick poll to understand what our audience thinks about the, the provider selection criteria in 2023? We will request the audience to key in the top provider selection criteria for, uh, for outsourcing. Okay, the poll has started. Let's see, uh, we are seeing the overall deal pricing and total contract value uh, almost reaching above 50%. And uh, even the proposed solution and transformation approach uh, is slightly behind. Okay, uh, we can close the poll in let's say five seconds now. Okay, uh, 
Yeah, so if I if I, if you can see the results, uh, we can clearly see the overall deal pricing and total contract value uh, is the highest. Around forty six percent of the respondent have uh, mentioned that as the the top uh, selection criteria, followed by the proposed solution and transformation approach. Uh, interesting results. Uh, so now let's see what our research indicate on the selection criteria in European geographies. We can move on. Okay, uh, in terms of the provider selection criteria for long term outsourcing deals, we typically observe four to five evaluation parameters being used. Uh, this typically includes service provider capabilities and cultural fit, uh, proposed transition and transformation approach, uh, pricing and contracting flexibility, and the proposed solution uh, and delivery models. More recently, we observed that the enterprises put a higher focus on the proposed transformation and transition approach uh, because of the mandates around cost optimization and ongoing and ongoing productivity improvements transition also plays an important role especially in the european deals where enterprises are more conservative in their transition approach than their north american uh, counterparts considering high degree of process variations and language uh, or cultural nuances Hence, uh, it has higher weightage of 23 to 29% compared to provider capability, which is around 18 to 24%. Uh, I'm also reminded of a deal uh, uh, we had advised recently uh, for a global food manufacturing giant, where the client shortlisted the provider who had proposed an outcome-based approach to transformation and showcased the possibility of a higher business impact savings through consulting projects, even though it was not the lowest bidder. So transformation is certainly an important winning criteria. Lately, uh, we have also noticed higher focus from enterprises to understand service provider commitment towards ESG and sustainability. Now, moving on to the other parameters in the next slide. <clears throat> uh, pricing and overall business case is clearly one of the top criteria for vendor selection, considering enterprise priorities around cost optimization. Enterprises are not just looking at prices, but also FTs considered and the year-on-year -year cost reduction through productivity improvements to compare at the overall TCV of the deal. Even commercial and contracting flexibility, providers' ability to put skin in the game through fees at risk, and overall pricing transparency also plays an important role nowadays. Hence, pricing and contracting typically has a higher weightage of 25 to 31% compared to you know, solution design and delivery model, right? And I think our audience uh, you know, clearly guessed it right uh, in this case. Uh, even for European deals, uh, the delivery locations proposed, uh, <clears throat> including the presence of nearshore and onshore uh, European geography sometimes play a crucial role in decision making. Let me bring Aman here. Uh, so Aman, given your experience with recent transformation deals, do you see the below criteria being significantly different for transformation deals compared to long-term managed services deals? So in our observation, we typically see higher weightages being assigned to solution design and delivery model as compared to pricing and contracting for transformation deals. In fact, in one of the recent deals which we were advising on for a leading German company for Oracle Cloud HCM implementation, it had one of the IPPs and one of the big fours as part of the providers being shortlisted for the scope. And if we talk about the deal commercials, the overall deal TCV for the implementation quoted by the big four provider was nearly twice that of the fee proposed by the IPP provider. However, the big four provider was shortlisted for the implementation primarily because of the business transformation approach brought in by the big four provider with strategic focus on blueprinting and design areas with certain roles focusing on enterprise architecture, strategy consulting, and program management. Moreover, in several transformation deals, we have often observed several other value adds such as targeted organizational change management advisory services, usage of design agencies, product alliance SMEs, and workforce transformation being positioned as key differentiators in transformation deals. Yeah. Thanks, Aman, for the insights. Quite interesting. Uh, moving on to the next section. Okay. 
so now we have covered the macroeconomic environment and the enterprise expectations from outsourcing so based on these inputs we will move, move on to how a european outsourcing deal should look like starting with pricing on the next slide Uh, so, uh, in terms of pricing, especially for BPO services, we have observed substantial FT rate increases in the previous 12 months on account of strong demand, talent shortage, and high wage inflation across key onshore, nearshore, and offshore geographies. The highest rate increases, around 4 to 5%, were observed across Western Europe and Nordic regions for both FNA and contact center services. However, Offshore locations like India saw a lower increases from 2.5 to 5 percent in contact center compared to finance and accounting, where we saw increases to the tune of 5 to 7 percent. Even across Eastern Europe, we saw increase in the rates despite the concerns over delivery due to the Ukraine-Russia conflict. Uh, the Very interesting. For... Rahul, so I just looking at the numbers, it seems that the the rate increases for India are actually lower than what we've seen in some of the onshore markets. I don't think we've seen that happen before in the last five to 10 years, right? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. That's a, a very valid observation. And, and that's actually to do with, uh, you know, the higher inflationary pressures, right, that we see at some of the onshore locations, uh, as well as the strong demand, right, uh, that we are seeing, right. So, so some of these factors are really playing out uh, when we look at higher increases in some of those onshore geographies compared to, you know, India location, right. So, yeah, valid observation, Vicky, on that. Okay, uh, so uh, when we look at some of the outlook for next 12 months, uh, we actually forecast a relatively lower rate increases to the tune of 1 to 4 percent, considering the recessionary pressures uh, that we are currently seeing, uh, even the easing of talent situations, uh, uh, the, the overall talent situation, and also the slowness in demand and customer decision making. Right. Uh, so the increases that we saw uh, are certainly, you know, going to moderate uh, is what uh, is what uh, you know we forecast currently. Uh, now let's move to the uh, uh, the pricing in the IT services area. Amin, uh, do you see similar trend in the IT side? Yes, sir. So on the IT skills, we have observed significant rate increases in the previous twelve months on account of high inflation and demand supply mismatch. If we talk about the geography, so Western Europe and Nordics have witnessed the highest rate increases last year. And if you talk about Eastern Europe, so despite the armed conflict, the broader Eastern Europe market consisting of Poland, Romania, and Slovakia, they have witnessed good demand for nearshoring and have observed an uptick in rates. If you talk about the skills, so the increase has been observed more for next generation IT skill sets, such as big data analytics, cybersecurity as compared to standard skill sets such as Java, .NET, Compute, Storage, and Backup. However, we anticipate a slower rate increase in the next 12 months on account of easing of supply side constraints and reduced demand. Uh, but if we look at uh, the overall market price, do we really foresee an overall market price reduction going forward? I think we are still uh, very far away from that. I think a very if interesting we, question which came up in the panel and probably applies to both the the slides that we just looked at, right? And yeah. I think we get this asked very often, right? And the, the question is, if CPI and inflation numbers are in more most countries touching double digit or closer to 10%, uh, why are the outsourcing prices not in the same quantum or not commensurate to that, right? And, and uh, Aman Rahul, if you can take that and I'll also add my point of view to this. Yeah. So if you talk about, so that's something that we have observed that the wage inflation, the rate of increase in wages is not commensurate with the price, right? So the price increase hasn't really been at par with the wage increase. And in certain cases, providers also have to take a margin hit as well. Uh, and that's something that we observed where uh, due to high wage increases and not at par price increases, service providers had to take a margin hit as well. So that's one of the reasons. Secondly, um, while the wages have increased, wages certainly form a part of the overall bill rate. So if we look at the 
bill break up the bill rate into various components so we would have wages and other components such as sgna and um, uh, and margins as well right so certainly providers uh, are facing a wage inflation pressure but they have also compensated on some of the other areas as well i think uh, if we can move on to the next slide so uh, given how much has pricing moved over the last 12 to 18 months due to inflation and other talent supply demand challenges we want to offer our buy side enterprise participants an opportunity to avail a complimentary diagnostic price check where they can choose a combination of three roles and three locations for which we will provide you with market benchmarks once you have chosen the select roles we will get back to you with a benchmark report for the chosen roles and locations all right i think let's take a look at some of the trends in other deal construction outsourcing deals in europe we move on to the next slide please so the second deal construct that we are going to cover is the delivery model and offshoring now considering the cost optimization priorities for enterprises offshoring is being used as a key lever by enterprises to realize their cost savings many european enterprises which had erstwhile a very conservative outlook towards offshoring are now more open to offshoring driven by rising cost pressures and higher maturity to outsourcing so aman uh, just to interrupt you on that and uh, ask a question so when it comes to specifically supporting voice based service desk contact center work especially for european languages german french italian what locations are you predominantly seeing being used by service providers in the market actually so uh, we often observe european enterprises to near show to low cost locations with the same language and cultural fit so for example for voice based services we observe many french enterprises prefer near showing near showing to countries such as morocco and egypt primarily because of the similar language uh, similarly many german based enterprises prefer near showing to poland because poland offers german speaking skill talent as well got it and generally speaking i mean we've last year we we debated a lot about the impact of U the ukraine conflict on on the european market so how has that generally impacted the choice of delivery locations per se from both our enterprises comfortable with with uh, look choosing locations close to U ukraine and similarly how, what are service providers uh, choosing to offer uh, as an alternative to ukraine now yeah so from an enterprise standpoint many enterprises are looking at viable alternatives and are offshoring more work than ever so if we categorize the countries on a continuum of relative maturity of offshoring we have observed that uk nordics and western europe have demonstrated the highest propensity to offshore work however historically countries in southern europe such as spain and portugal have depicted relatively lower maturity of offshoring due to historical neg negative perceptions language barriers and buyer concerns around data privacy and security and they were in fact more open to near showing to countries in latin america such as argentina and mexico due to cultural affinity and same language however we are now observing a break in the trend in the past one to two years where enterprises in spain and portugal are now more open to offshoring work driven by increasing cost pressures and improved service provider focus got it there's one more question from the audience which we can take on this slide is there a, a vertical or an industry flavor to this have you seen financial services being more open or being more close to offshoring in in europe specifically yeah i think we have advice on several financial services deals uh, which uh i mean if i talk about several large banks in europe we have advice on such deals where there has been um more openness to offshoring um i think that's uh if i talk about some of the large deals that we have uh, advised on um yeah so i i i think i would say that we have certainly seen more offshoring for bfsi clients particularly um yeah so that would be in my day cons got it so generally the larger financial services you would say are 
more comfortable i think i've, I've been part of some of these deals right where they they're very open to the concept of uh, leveraging low cost locations in in asia and in europe to sort of uh, outsource to for, for any sort of uh, it and back office support work yeah okay i think uh, we can now take a look at some of the trends in offshoring by functions in the next slide so we often observe uh service providers taking a slightly conservative view of offshoring in european deals as compared to north american deals mostly owing to the language related nuances in europe so for example if we talk about adm deals we often see offshoring to be close to 70 to 80% in deals whereas in north america this would typically be close to 82 to 82% moreover if we talk about uh offshoring so by function so we have witnessed more offshoring for adm infrastructure and bpo deals as opposed to transformational sids which involve a high percentage of client facing roles such as functional consultants change management consultants program managers enterprise architects etc in fact in many uh, adm and bpo bids we have seen global providers often position their strong capabilities in near shore europe such as poland and even using tier 2 cities in spain such as huesca valladolid and in italy as well as key win differentiators and they are expanding into european onshore geographies if we talk about the ipps so ipps tend to subcontract in less mature locations such as spain when they are participating in large is primarily because of the capabilities that they have So, Ricky, one question. Uh, so, how do you really see cloud managed services playing out in the below market sector? Um, I think cloud managed services is uh, when with when it started, it was obviously at a lower percentage of offshore because uh, there was generally a skepticism about. can we have the right set of people uh, doing this from offshore do we need more onshore support in in non business hours and thing and this sorry in business hours so there was some initial uh, skepticism maybe 2 to 3 years ago but now i think as much as it is common to any managed services deal the the extent of offshoring is pretty high so in fact we've seen a lot of uh, large gsi system integrators have created large offshore shared delivery centers for delivering cloud services because uh, from these delivery centers from the shared delivery centers they are able to cater to multiple accounts uh, they could be catering to accounts which have just 50 vms and going up to 5000 vms and they possibly using the same delivery center and they are able to bring in a lot of efficiencies and bring in a lot of scale and automation because they're doing this via shared delivery construct so i would say if i were to put cloud in this i would say probably uh, above the 80% offshore or cl definitely closer to 80 to 90% sort of offshore number specifically for cloud managed services okay thanks to key for the perspectives i think it's time to also delve deeper into the productivity improvements uh, that we see in deals but before that i think let's run a poll with our participants on what savings are your providers committing to over a five year deal term so uh, we will request the audience to pin the productivity over the five year deal term from the options provided in the poll we will open the poll now so i think if we look at the results what we are getting is primarily 20 to 24% uh, productivity over a five year deal term is the predominant answer so far i think we can end the poll in the next 5 seconds okay so yeah so i think uh, predominantly what we are getting is that uh, 20 to 24% is the productivity that we are seeing and i think it's something that uh, we are we would also want to deep, uh, deep dive into it so primarily if we talk about um, productivity gains by different outsourcers um, i mean if we talk about second third generation outsourcers we used to see a lot of high productivity but are we really seeing a uh, slightly tapered off productivity in new deals especially the third and the fourth generation so i think with that notion we can move on to the next slide and discuss about the productivity that we are seeing in deals 
So if you look at the history for the productivity figures that service providers have been able to deliver in outsourcing contracts in the past decade, we observe that in the first half of the decade, process standardization and knowledge management were the key levers which were used to deliver productivity improvements while automation was still at its nascent stage. Now, all of this resulted in the net productivity improvement of 25 to 30% over a period of five years. And in the later half of the decade, if we observe enterprise automation, uh, if, if we look at uh, the new productivity levers, right? So we found out that enterprise automation was being deployed, which focused on resolution of low hanging fruit, that is service requests, L2 incidents, and technical monitoring, right? So these were the main, uh, I would say, items which were uh, automated, right? And if you talk about uh, self-service and self-heal, these were yet to be fully adopted, right? So in this period, enterprises were able to achieve the maximum productivity gains due to the extensive usage of automation on your portfolio. Now, going forward, as we observe more and more third and fourth generation and even fifth generation outsourcers, we believe that many of the productivity gains through automation have already been passed on to the clients. Moreover, self-service, self-heal, and conversational chatbots are still applied to a very narrow set of use cases, and therefore, we anticipate a lower productivity of 20 to 25% in these going forward, which is in similar lines to the poll that we have done this, uh, right now. Right. So, so this is something that we are seeing in deals now. Over to over to you, Rahul. So, what is your really what is your take on the automation-related price impro uh, improvement for BPO services? Thanks, Aman. Uh, for the BPO service, we are actually seeing a different trend. Uh, we still notice an increasing trend in the five-year productivity improvements which are proposed by the BPO service providers. Uh, I mean, this may be because uh, relatively on the BPO side, uh, there is low market penetration uh, compared to IT, and in general, you know, the overall outsourcing maturity, uh, you know, overall average, uh, if, I, if I take, right, is still comparatively lower, right? That's where we are still seeing that, you know, increasing trend in year-on-year uh, -year productivity improvements. Uh, not only uh, the quantum, uh, the quantum benefit has increased in BPO, but also the uh, also some of those benefits um, are actually front-loaded from year one or year to itself, right? So that is also, you know, one of the trend we are, uh, you know, uh, seeing in the market. Depending upon, you know, the VPO functions, uh, we have seen that the productivity improvement range uh, can vary from, let's say, around 30% to 45% uh, on an average for a five-year deal, right? Uh, so some of the numbers you have quoted, you know, uh, seem to be quite different, right, in VPO service, uh, Aman. So if I just okay. sort of want to throw in a possibility, is it possible because most of the BPO deals are still sort of gen one outsourcing deals where possibly they're doing it for the first time and that's why there are a lot of low hanging fruits where, which is why, which is one of the reasons why we're seeing almost a 30, 40% uh, productivity improvement being able to be able to achieve over a five year period as compared to that IT services has been much more mature, been around and I think we rarely see Gen zero or Gen one outsourcing deals anymore. Most of them are in fact in Gen two, Gen three, or Gen four as well. So, uh, would that also be one of the reasons why, which is driving the variance between the BPO and the IT services market in this case? Certainly, Ricky. Right, uh, you have uh, put the uh, you know nail uh, on the head. Right, uh, in this case. Uh, so, in the BPO side, the overall uh, you know market penetration is definitely lower. Right. Uh, so, we see a lot of. Uh, you know, Gen 1, Gen 2 uh, kind of, uh, Gen 2 kind of deals as well, right? While on the IT side, you know, we actually observe more of Gen 3 or 4, uh, uh, you know, generation uh, outsourcing as well, right? And that's where some of those, uh, some of the juice is already squeezed out, right? So, uh, but in the BPO side, right, uh, we are actually seeing transformation uh, being looked at, uh, you know, very, uh, uh, really looked at uh, you know positively by enterprises they are trying to uh, not just you know the year on year productivity improvement right but they are also looking at some of the other levers uh, let's say business outcome uh, uh, in in as part of their current deals right so that's that's you know bang on uh, ricky okay all right okay uh, interesting points out on the productivity games observed in bpo services so, so far we have talked about various solutioning levers such as offshoring, productivity gains, et cetera, right? 
Now let's shift our focus to some of the contractual terms, right? So first and foremost, let's look at what we are seeing in the market in terms of cola clauses, which is amongst the most talked about topics last year in the outsourcing services space. If we move on to the next slide. So what we saw towards the end of the last decade or at the beginning of the pandemic was that in many cases, the deals that were signed did not have a cola clause in them. And even in cases where cola clause was present, it was quite common to see cola clause being waived out in deals. Now, enterprises were applying pressure on providers and some of the providers were accommodating on the request to waive off the cola, right? Now, why does this happen, right? So this was happening primarily because the operating cost prior to COVID for providers was not materially impacted due to stable inflation, be it at onshore and offshore, right? However, from 2021 onwards, right, there has been unprecedented inflation observed across all the major outsourcing locations. And we have observed COLA being applied on deals with greater force and intensity. So if you look at the past 18 months, we have observed wage inflation to be rising at an unprecedented level in deals at onshore. Whereas if we talk about offshore, uh, historically, uh, so COLA has, so historically there has been wage inflation. I mean, there has been wage inflation at offshore as well. However, historically Forex used to be an offsetting factor to high wage increase in European deals. However, in the past 18 months, INR had also appreciated against the Euro, which ultimately led to a net inflationary pact. So this resulted in an increase in adoption of COLA clauses in contracts in the past year. However, going forward due to easing of inflation and the growing uncertainty, it is expected that COLA waivers and no COLA contracts could make a comeback in deals. All right, I think Rahul, uh, do you want to talk about the benchmarking clause in the next slide? Sure, um... Yes, uh, so another important contracting clause that we highly recommend uh, during the current times of uncertainty is the inclusion of the benchmarking clause, right? So what is this benchmarking clause, right? So benchmarking clause uh, has been included in the contract by enterprises to ensure that the service provider pricing and performance is evaluated during the deal term and any adjustments are made uh, based on their their the current market pricing or performance right? however earlier the benchmarking clause used to be a bit generic and providers or enterprises used to make their own interpretations during actual negotiations more recently we are observing and also trying to educate the market for the need of a more detailed and prescriptive benchmarking clause so, so what should be, you know, uh, the typical components of a, of a ideal benchmarking uh, clause, right? Uh, so it should definitely have the overall benchmarking scope, uh, the roles and responsibilities of the parties uh, that are involved, right? Both service provider, uh, <clears throat> the enterprise, or even the, the third party benchmarker in this case, right? Uh, even some of the benchmarking execution related considerations, right? So let's say the number of uh, deals that uh, needs to be considered uh, for those benchmarking to be relevant, right? Some of the specific nuances, right? That the benchmarker should consider, right? Some of those considerations should be included. And most importantly, the actual consequences uh, coming out of the benchmarking uh, engagement. Right. So, for example, within consequences, how the benchmarking result should be interpreted, right? Uh, how the the actual, uh, you know, the pricing um, or the overall solution should change, right? Based on this, okay. What is the way forward if a provider rejects the proposed changes, right? That were uh, that were advised by the benchmarker, right? Or, uh, you know, does the benchmarking clause also have an escalation mechanism, right, during a dispute, right? So all of these uh, different aspects, right, need to be clearly articulated, right, uh, for that benchmarking clause to be highly effective. Right? Um, if, I, if I talk of last year, uh, we also saw instances where uh, enterprises has even funded these benchmarking exercises, you know, especially in some of the strategic, uh, you know, relationship engagements, uh, so as to validate the price hike request 
from their providers right so last uh, you know year we saw a lot of service providers reaching out to their enterprise clients for some of the price hikes uh, and that's where uh, some of these enterprises uh, went ahead invested uh, themselves uh, and and did some of these benchmarking uh, exercises right uh, and based on these exercises they also you know kind of uh, provided justifiable increase wherever it was actually necessary right uh, going forward as well, I think, uh, uh, this... and and just to staying staying on that topic up uh, for a few more minutes, Rahul. Just there was a question from the audience again, which says that what's the average duration after which the benchmarking clause can kick in, or what's the when can the enterprise exercise that right to do a benchmarking after the contract is signed? Uh, do you have a perspective on that? Sure, sure, definitely, uh, Ricky. Right. So generally, uh, you know, at like the mid term of of the overall contract, right, is where uh, the benchmarking uh, is generally uh, kind of executed, right, by both enterprises and service provider, right. So if it's a five year deal, right, just after maybe second year or you know start of third year is uh, you know ideal time to look at okay where we are. Uh, and and uh, in terms of the overall performance of the service providers, uh, sometimes uh, you know enterprises uh, uh, also uh, you know become uh, quite proactive, right? So if they are not seeing the relevant uh, uh, the the relevant performance, right, uh, that they were expecting, right, they they can uh, also invoke uh, earlier as well. But generally, we have seen uh, you know those invoked uh, kind of a mid term, right? But at least after a year uh, that has gone by, right? Uh, yeah generally these are invoked i think one more question i think which you answered earlier right and there was the question around how do you have more transparency in terms of the price increase conversations right how do you make them more objective and not a sort of a tug of war in terms of who's the better negotiator on the table i think um, wanted to add that benchmarking clauses is one of the, the more objective ways to actually have a decision right we've seen multiple situations where uh, an enterprise and provider are at loggerheads in terms of are they getting a good deal or not right and providers always like okay this is the best we can do we are losing money on this deal but we still want to continue the relationship and we're giving you this offer but enterprise still feels oh this is very expensive we're getting better off we could potentially get better offers from the market right and to sort of avoid this having this tussle between the enterprise and the client and provider we've often been involved as benchmarkers or advisors uh, sort of a third party benchmarkers into these contracts and the benchmarking report then forms a good basis for having that forward looking negotiation right okay the current what's the the current health of the relationship who is who, what's the and maybe you know what sometimes it's not always about that oh there's a 10 percent optimization but maybe there's not but then there are certain pockets of optimization which will then allow you to have those specific remedies against specific pieces of the contract rather than doing a a, a sort of a blank a, a full fledged uh, increase across the entire contract right so that sort of helps that of having a more objective uh negotiation or discussion with the between the client and the enterprise i think this this one more question very interesting in your experience did the benchmarking exercise add value in terms of uh, reducing prices so i think I, I kind of talked about that earlier right so it's not just about reducing prices all the time it's also about sometimes for the enterprise to have a sort of comfort that okay they are getting a good deal from the from from the vendor right it's also not about okay maybe i don't even want to squeeze my provider to the extent that the relationship becomes unsustainable right so sometimes also about that okay am i uh, there are some challenges in terms of slis there have been multiple situations which have happened over the last year where the clients have come back to us saying that oh i'm having challenges in terms of me, my provider not meeting slas and the resource fulfillment timelines have gone for a toss and then we're like okay let's let's look at your pricing right because sometimes you ultimately get what you pay for in a way so uh, in those situations uh, doing a baseline right because when they actually did the the baselining or the benchmarking exercise themselves, they realized that okay, they actually the the pricing that they were paying to their vendor were actually much lower than the market, right? They were ten percent below market, and then they realized that okay, maybe there is the the, the price increase requests that have come from the vendor do they do have some merit, right? They be whatever deal we signed a few years ago that is probably not sustainable anymore. So that is where the value add really comes in, right? So even though they might not the, the enterprise did not agree to that entire ten percent increase that was requested by the provider but they they realized that okay where they are what is the position compared to the market and they should probably 
agree to some part of that increase and then what that part was across different parts of the portfolio again is open to discussion and negotiation but it the the conversation at least went in the direction which was much more objective and and structured so go ahead rahul and, and yeah just to add an example right uh, and great point you mentioned right uh, so it's not just about the pricing right uh, sometimes and in fact uh, you know this was related to a uh, an rpo deal right a recruitment process outsourcing deal uh, where you know we were uh, benchmarking uh, you know mid term and one of the challenge that uh, the enterprise had mentioned is that the service provider was not uh, was not actually meeting some of the slas right so the acquis the the talent acquisition timelines right uh, uh, is something that they were not actually meeting right uh, and that's where uh, you know we we actually looked at the overall market data right from the from the overall slas and we observed that because of the overall talent pressure uh, you know and and finding the right talent was very difficult during that time not just uh, you know the the current uh, engagement right but lot of other engagement we saw similar challenge right and that's where we kind of you know explained uh, and objectively mentioned right to the enterprise that uh, you know everyone is currently facing the same situation in fact uh, you know the slas were a, a lot stringent right uh, that you have currently put in and uh, the overall level at which the service provider is delivering in terms of the acquisition timelines is much higher than the market right so that actually gave a comfort to the enterprise uh, to to look at you know things objectively from the market right so it's not always about the price uh, in this case it was actually about uh, you know the the slas and performance aspect right okay uh, so also just want to talk about uh, uh, the benchmarking cl clause right going forward we also uh, i mean there's definitely an increase probability of recession and there is also possibility of price reduction uh, right in the future right so considering that a comprehensive benchmarking clause can help both enterprises and service provider align their overall pricing and performance with the market as well Right. So that's something you know worth considering for sure. Uh, next, uh, we would uh, we would want to move to another important outsourcing deal construct uh, related to the incentive mechanism and outcome based uh, constructs uh, in the deal. So the uh, outcome based constructs or the incentive mechanism uh, is a crucial element of the contemporary deals right the outcome uh, these constructs basically refer to commercial constructs that are added in the contract to incentivize the service provider with higher bonus payments for over achieving the target uh, client business outcome right this outcome business outcome could be either a uh, actual dollar impact or it could be an improvement in the business metric right uh, this is slightly different than the typical gain sharing on account of higher productivity improvement that you know uh, that we see uh, normally right that we have been seeing right rather in this case the incentive is actually linked to a client outcome like uh, dso reduction or a you know dpo optimization or a overall sourcing spend reduction right for example uh we have observed a higher adoption of uh, the outcome based construct in in contemporary deals especially across large enterprises and enterprises with higher outsourcing maturity okay and and these uh, you know this this kind of a persona uh, what we observe is that they are generally ready to take uh, relatively higher risk and also have a higher investment appetite right for for doing such projects right Uh, so these uh, you know definitely these outcome based constructs are a win win situation for both service provider and enterprises and is definitely recommended as a uh, as an inclusion in contemporary deals right uh, for enterprises it helps them achieve a business outcome right for service providers it's it's a kind of a margin uh, it's it's a opportunity for improving their overall you know margins as well right uh also what we have seen uh, you know recently many service providers are trying to differentiate themselves in the market by taking an outcome based approach right we have seen deals totally swung uh, to a service provider just because of you know complete uh, outcome based approach and the, the overall possibility that they had shown to their enterprise in terms of uh, you know the the delivery the the business the dollar value impact that they can actually generate 
Right. Uh, so, Ricky, have you seen any recent example of an outcome-based construct and deal? Uh, Yes, yes, absolutely. I think uh, that's what we're going to talk about in the next slide. Uh, we're going to talk about a, one example, right? I mean, I think what we love all appreciate is outcome-based models are easier said than done, right? In theory, they all sound amazing. They sound uh, great, but when it comes to real implementation on ground, there are some real challenges associated associated with it. In spite of that, we've seen a few providers actually risk or sort of take the the, the risk of actually trying out those and and being successful with those. So this is one example which I can cover. There's a there was a big four service provider, and, and again there's a nuance in terms of maybe we've seen big four providers to be a bit more necessary just to set some context big four typically include the likes of deloitte evi pwc those sort of companies uh we've seen typically seen big four companies to be a bit more uh open in terms of how they structure some of these technology uh implementation deals as compared to the the traditional system integrators the likes of an exchanger ibm kindrel and so on uh so this was a specific deal for a large uk based fortune 500 sort of an organization for a large oracle fusion implementation right and this uh they, they were dividing a, they were planning on a comprehensive business transformation through the oracle fusion implementation across five five uh, broad geographical regions and uh, the project was constructed in such a way that it was divided into three phases uh, there's phase one of discovery design and delivery and uh, we were mainly involved after the discovery phase was done where the provider had assessed uh, the landscape and they had come up with a design and a delivery plan now they had what they had proposed for the design but the design phase was roughly about 12 months and they proposed an outcome based model for this design phase and which, which is where we got involved to sort of help with the, the enterprise on evaluating this outcome based model right um, so while the overall uh, the, the target fees was roughly about 20 million pounds uh, for the for the 12 months which is significant amount of money uh, only for the design phase this was this was split into three broad categories so uh, the 50 percent of the fee was in such a way that there was fixed and it wasn't linked to any particular outcome of course of course split into 12 consecutive monthly payments right this is for the provider to recover some of their core costs and not make a loss or in fact not sort of uh, but completely get uh, get a loss on this deal. So 50% of the fee was fixed. 30% of the fee was such that it was contingent on completing specific uh, deliverables, which are which were very core to the objectives. And then 20% uh, of the fees was contingent on meeting certain client specific selection criteria uh, and mainly around satisfaction so they had they had clearly defined on terms of how will they measure the satisfaction so it wasn't nothing was left to to the users uh, to the readers imagination they define very clearly on how will they measure satisfaction who will be the people where the survey will be run who will be used for measuring the satisfaction across business and it and the entire fee was linked uh, ranging from uh, zero percent to going up to 200% as well, right? If, if, the, if they exceeded their expectations, if they uh, sort of met, went over and above what they were expected to do, they, this would go up to 200% as well. So the 20% could effectively even become 40%. So the provider would actually, in theory, could even make 120% of the fees. Now, this was a deal which we saw happen and it was fairly successful. And of course, uh, the enterprise was, uh, uh, they, they did go ahead and sign this deal. Uh, the, the satisfaction fee based was based on criteria such as the quality of the deliverable, senior level engagement, uh, business knowledge, uh, the, and the scores were based on factors which were decided by an executive committee, which comprised of senior stakeholders from both the enterprise and the provider. And uh, of course, there was a as we as i mentioned there was a significant upside to the whole uh, of 200 percent to the satisfaction fee which effectively meant uh, an overall 20 percent upside on the overall fee in design phase itself so we've seen this happen and then 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 we've also seen variants of this uh over the in the market over the last six months as well so this is something which is something for uh, both clients uh, enterprises and providers to watch out for over the next uh, two to three years uh, just sort of st uh, moving on and sort of staying, but staying in this conversation, right? So Rahul, I think you've been privy to a lot of PPO deals where, in fact, not just BPO, but any outsourcing deals where um, risk sharing and gain share mechanisms uh, have been a common talking point, right? Um, how do you see they've evolved over time, right? Um, 
Sure, uh, Ricky, right. I can definitely take that. Uh, so certainly, you know, in terms of the trend overall, uh, I do see a lot more, uh, a lot more RFPs, a lot more contracts, right, where uh, the gain sharing mechanism or the rich sharing mechanism is currently articulated, right, than what I used to see, let's say, you know, three or four years uh, uh, back. Right. Uh, and uh, especially on the risk sharing aspect. Right. Uh, so that's a common, you know, word, uh, right, that uh, many enterprises currently ask, right, uh, what's your skin in the game currently, right. Uh, so uh, that's, that's a question, you know, service providers uh, definitely need to answer, right, uh, and, and some of those uh, uh, some of those mechanisms like fees at risk uh, that have been put by uh, in in the contract, right? Try and help them answer some of these uh, uh, some of these questions, right? Even when I talk of uh, some of the gain sharing uh, mechanisms, right? Uh, so uh, you know earlier, uh, especially in some of the BPO uh, deals, right? Uh, we used to see a lot of uh, a lot of these gain sharing mechanisms uh, primarily linked to the productivity improvement uh, aspects right however now we are also you know seeing uh, some of these mechanism being linked to actual business uh, outcomes as well right uh, uh, not and not just uh, you know the dollar value impact but even some of the uh, metric performance right so enterprises trying to improve some of their metrics try and just add an additional bonus uh, to the service provider fee, right? We are also seeing, uh, uh, you know, some of those mechanisms where the bonus is uh, linked uh, not just to the service provider fee, right? But it's actually linked to the business outcome as well. Yes. So, so certainly, right? To answer uh, in a short, right? We are certainly seeing uh, an increase in the overall gain sharing mechanisms and sharing mechanisms in contracts. Got it. Interesting. So, we we uh, there are two questions which possibly we could take up as part of the Q&A as well, I think. Uh, so one of the slides where we spoke about offshoring and locations, and I think we mentioned that South Africa is being used for uh, near shore delivery or for especially for voice based work. And I have seen that personally in, in a lot of in some deals, not a lot of deals, but in some deals have seen South Africa being used for IT service desk. And I think Rahul, you would confirm that you've seen that on the contact center on the BPO side as well. So. Uh, yeah, yeah. In your experience, any particular reason why South Africa sometimes comes out on top as compared to, let's say, an in India or a Philippines? Yeah, I think uh, I think it's to do with some of the, especially when I talk of the contact center uh, area, right? A uh, lot of the, uh, you know, uh, the UK market uh, in general, right, or the European market, right, uh, tend to prefer South Africa, right, because uh, because of the uh, the overall uh, the 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 actual uh, the matching right in terms of the actual work hours between the two countries right also uh, if you look at the overall cultural affinity right the language fluency uh, right uh, any uh, the, the, that's a that's a great match right that we see uh, when especially the South African resource right uh, interacting with let's say uh, let's say a, a, a UK uh, a, a UK uh, a person right calling right so 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 some of those uh, elements uh, and as well as uh, as well as the overall reduction in the fees right that we see uh, uh, for South Africa so some of these reasons uh, you know we are seeing South Africa is is kind of becoming more preferred option for contact center uh, you know compared to let's say uh, you know India kind of a location right. All right. Uh, thank you so much um, for that, Rahul. I think we can have, uh, we can go on and on about uh, this is because this is very core to us, but we are running out of time. So um, just uh, with the final slide, we all part of the pricing assurance team where we offer retainer or based offerings for uh, enterprise clients in terms of getting help on their outsourcing contracts in terms of pricing. So that's the last bit I'll, I'll leave you with.